Hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining our conversations on Paza. Paza, a Swahili word meaning to amplify, is an initiative by Disability Trust. Paza seeks to document and create visibility for the experiences of women with disabilities globally. We look forward to hearing from you. So remember to share your support and feedback on our social media platforms. To continue this conversation, please follow our Twitter page at Paza Podcast. For more content on this ability's work and projects, please follow this ability on Twitter and Instagram at this underscore ability underscore ke and on Facebook at disability.ke. Now, let's get into today's topic of discussion. Thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon. And today we wanted to discuss the role of un unpaid care work, um, guardianship and legal capacity, particularly exploring the experience of women with disabilities within the global pandemic. And we are very pleased to be joined by um, amazing speakers who are amazing champions for children with disabilities. And I will let them introduce themselves. So can we start with you, Sylvia? Could you introduce yourself, please, and the work that you do? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvia Moramu Chabo. I am the founder of Andy Speaks for Special Needs Persons, um, a graphic designer by profession, a mother of three boys, two of whom are on the autism spectrum. And uh, raising the children is um, exactly what led me to do what I do in terms of um, advocacy. Great, thank you very much. Caroline, would you like to go next? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Caroline Makana. I'm a mother of three boys, my eldest son, Ethan, being on the autism spectrum. I'm a lawyer by profession, and my husband and I also run a school um, here in Nairobi for special needs kids. And I'm pleased to join you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, and we have um, the team from Disability joining us as uh, discussants. Um, Maria Rosa, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Lizzie. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Maria, Maria Rosa. Uh, I'm from Ecuador, and I'm the project manager in disability. Thank you. Millicent? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Millicent Ojuang, mm -hmm. Operations and Admin Manager, Disability. And Clarence? Hi, everyone. My name is Clarence Okune, Media Officer, Disability Trust. My name is Lizzie Kiyama, and I am the Managing Trustee at Disability Trust. Um, and our work really is to advance the right and inclusion of women with disabilities um, in Kenya. To get into it, Sylvia, you run an organization, um, Andy Speaks, if I'm not wrong? Yes. Could you tell us about what led you to start the organization, some inspiration behind it? And you've alluded to it, but please give us some more details. <laughs> oh, sorry for that. Um, so um, I am a single parent, just to add on to that. And um, starting off this journey was a bit confusing at first. The minute you get the diagnosis and you do not know where to start, who to turn to, where this came from, what this is, because most of the time it is progressive. In my side of the story, first we had a convulsive disorder before we discovered that uh, my son, my, my second child, were, who's called Andrew, was on the autism spectrum. And by the time I was being given this news of really pregnant, it was actually almost the same day with my last born, who after his birth also we saw that his milestones were delayed. Although his um, were not as severe, my son spoke at five and the journey by the time I could get a grip and get evaluation and actually get to see the right doctors in this setup. Uh, the journey of actually getting him to school because you, you, he would be accepted and admitted into a school and after a while you see there is no progress then there comes other demands from the schools then when you're sitting for parent teacher conferences and um, you're being looked at like they cannot handle your child anymore they don't understand what's going on so let's just say the journey was a bit frustrating coupled with trying to get through a divorce at the same time was uh, not one of the easiest things. So I, I 
tried to find my way through that forest because that's what it felt like. Like you were just put in the beginning of the forest and you're told, let's meet on the other side. Uh, there is no map, there is no torch, just figure your way out. So um, when I sat and I tried to figure how the journey had been, how, wonder how many other parents were going through a similar situation. How is it across the country? Because there was also the stigma that comes with it uh, in the social setting and also within the families and um, within, within the school setup also, because by now the children could see that because of the development, they were also getting frustrated. And uh, um, apart from that, the, I'm a prayerful person. So I kept receiving this message of Proverbs 31, 8 to 9, which uh, was to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves and fight for their justice. For that was it back in 2018. I knew deep inside I used to do social, on social media advocacy and just talk about what autism is. And not many people actually believed that my son was autistic because he looks like a normal child and that's how slowly but surely I got to connect with other parents and by the end of the 2018 um, my sister also has a child who has Down syndrome and I spent some time with her and uh, I finally decided okay when I was I did an interview with the daily newspaper and from there the way the story came out you know when you take a retrospect and look at the story from the outside that's when I was now, everything made sense about the, the conviction of, of doing something, the Bible verse, the experience that what was going on around me. And, and that's when I decided, okay, so because the title of uh, the article that was done in the Daily Nation, that was the, this, the last day of December, 2018, was uh, my son finally called me mom. That's how the name Andy Speaks came about. So. We want to be the champions on the ground and the voice for persons with neurodevelopmental disabilities. So it's not only just autism, but the full neurodevelopmental dis dis or disorder uh, group. To just uh, looking at the rules and regulations that are there, there is a lot of lack of inclusion. And at the same time, we look at the education systems, there are no sufficient schools. When we look at the health system, it, it was quite a daunting task to actually find a doctor who knows what it is that you need. So you're sent from one place to another before we could find out what was the best uh, intervention for him. And uh, so to see how best this could be corrected, I decided I will take up the mantle and to the Andy Speaks for Special Needs Persons Africa. We started the work for advocacy so that parents can come out so that we can end stigma because we are better in, in bigger numbers. And um, engage with government and other bodies that are responsible for looking out and setting policies for our children so that we are also included in all the decision making that is going on at the moment. So that's in summary what Andy Speaks is all about and how it came about. Wow. Thank you. Um, Caroline, um, could you tell us about your yeah. own experience, you know, both from a professional and a personal standpoint? I relocated back uh, to Kenya. I, I lived in the UK in, in around 2008. Um, at the time, my youngest brother was very ill in the UK. And I had just had my son, Ethan, my first son. Um, after about 18 months in after he was born i noticed that there was a bit of a of a difference with him in terms of his receptive uh, uh, behavior you know just you know playing with other children there was something that was different but because i was so overwhelmed with my youngest brother being ill at the moment at that time i sort of put it behind uh, my mind and said look when I get to Nairobi I'll figure what's wrong so when we came back to Nairobi um, I then started uh, sort of researching to find out what was wrong with uh, my son so we went to see our pediatrician and he said look um, your son seems to be on the autism spectrum and I was like what is that so then we were referred to the Gatroods in Madaiga and we went there. They run a program called the Special Educational Program, which uh, involves uh, 
different professionals, occupational therapy, speech therapy, pediatricians, and they sort of sit with you in a room and they assess your child and, you know, try to figure out uh, what might be wrong with the progression of the child. So after that meeting, I was told that Ethan is autistic. And I think that was the hardest, probably one of the hardest days of my life. And, you know, the, the first question you ask is, you know, what do we do about it? Is there any medication? Is, is there any treatment for it? And then you're told there's no treatment. So then that did, that's how the journey began. And, you know, sort of getting back and trying to settle down, trying to figure out life. And I was a single mother at the time. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a, uh, a job uh, locally in a bank. You know, getting childcare at the time was also difficult because your child is nonverbal and f just getting people who understand um, how, the, how that works was very difficult. You go to work, you come home, the child is very unsettled. But eventually, uh, by God's grace, I got a very good nanny and then we got a really good routine going. So I was very, at that moment I was settled and then uh, subsequently I joined the judiciary and I had to travel a lot but thankfully I had a really good nanny at home and a really good support system my parents and my siblings were very supportive so that allowed me to work and uh, focus on 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 providing um, with ease and as, the, and as the years went by you know the, he was quite stable uh, he was uh, at a school in Nairobi. He had settled in quite well. So we had a good routine going on. And I, I felt like he thrived from that. Just that stability and the structures really helped. And then we also put him on a good diet that had been suggested for him. So the hyperactivity reduced. So that was good. Um, so subsequently, I met my husband about four years ago. The funny thing is that he had actually volunteered and worked in the UK at a school for uh, autism. And as God will have it, he also had a dream of starting a school and so did I. So it happened that uh, after Ethan um, had been to a few schools and we just felt as though we were not getting the support that we required for him, we decided we'll start our own um, it just started very small in terms of um, like a homeschooling environment and then other parents joined as well. Um, so down the line, it's been very, very uh, fulfilling to see other children coming into our space and just being able to benefit from whatever my husband learned and what he knows um, about autism. And other children as well have joined with other conditions, uh, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. It's been very fulfilling to be able to do that and also, you know, sort of have my career going on at the same time. And we also have two uh, younger boys as well. Um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a, it's been, I think, I think finding out that my son was autistic was the thing that turned my life around. Uh, I think he made me, he, that made me the best version of me. And I'm truly lucky and privileged to have him as my eldest son. I think, I think that's, that's about it in terms of, the journey so far. Great, thank you. Did you have any prior experience with disabilities before your children? Sylvia? Uh, personally, um, no, uh, n never. Not even like in where we were living uh, before growing up. I know I'd only seen one person, but you know, according to the African culture, most of the people just brand them as that's a mad person. Right. Uh, and, and stuff like that. So later mm -hmm. on, perspective is when you're like, actually, this person could have been, that person could have been, you yeah. know, part of the, the strife that came in the family when there is a lot of the finger pointing of mm -hmm. this came from your family, this came from your family, you know, because it's yeah. usually a reaction after the diagnosis. Right. And yourself, Caroline? Um, when I lived in the UK, I did. Um, uh, we, I lived in a very close-knit uh, neighborhood. I think while I was, I was raising my son, uh, a couple of people at our church did point out that they thought maybe he was uh, on the autism spectrum, but I didn't take any sort of um, serious uh, thought into that, uh, being that I was already you know, going through the issue with my brother. But 
thankfully where I lived, it was a very open thing. You'd see people on their wheelchairs. And my brother was also on a wheelchair because he had multiple sclerosis. And when he went into a care home, I also got to interact with other people with disabilities. So I did have um, some personal experience on that level, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a, a follow-up to, you mentioned the school. Um, could you tell us the yeah. name of the school? The school is called Haven Cottage and we are located in Kilaleshwa on Othaira oh. Road. Yeah. Okay, okay. Do you have any uh, non-disabled children in, in the school? No, at the moment we're doing purely special needs. Okay. Do you think it's an environment that yeah. you could bring in uh, non-disabled children? Do you think it's um, something that would probably um, add value to, to them as well? We've had, we've had um, vocational training and we also have a holiday uh, training program. Uh, and we've partnered with a friend of ours in ICT and she's a family uh, ICT consultant. We have a, after, after the normal term is over, we usually have a two week uh, vocational training program where we integrate our children with other children. Um, and, 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 they, and they get on quite well. And it's been very, very, uh, very great to see ch other children learn about children with special needs and learning to be more inclusive learning to be more patient, um, just, just seeing uh, children grow up, uh, you know, having that mental capacity to be inclusive is, is very special. Yeah. And I think when we start now, it, it will become, uh, the stigma will go out the window. And I think as we've been raising our children, we've really seen a lot of stigma, encountered a lot of it. Uh, but when you're more inclusive and more open about your own story, about your own journey, I think people are more understanding and more inclusive. And not talking about it is really very counterproductive, I think. Yes. So we're very open and we talk about it a lot. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So in this situation where um, we are social distancing and isolating yeah. I'm wondering what your experience has been in terms of um, the burden of unpaid care work, some of the things that you do for your family as women, as mothers. Mm. Could we have a conversation about that? And if you think it has increased that burden, you know, in this um, difficult times, has it reduced? Do you have support at home? You know, is your partner at home? Do you have extra mm. help from family and things like that? So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, uh, is that something that you feel comfortable sharing? What's going on? It's um, everything has gone like tenfold in terms of you know you had routines before because children on the autism spectrum thrive on routine, and right now, okay, it's it's easier now because it's been a month for for our family right now. The fact that uh, we are all now living in an apartment setting makes it even harder because the space for playing is not there. Like they, they usually go out to play over the weekends. So they're not seeing their regular weekday routine. They're not seeing their Saturday routine. They're not seeing their Sunday routine. So it was like um, every, their world came to a standstill. Uh, I've, seen a, I've seen regression in my son regression in terms of now there's no therapy because he gets speech therapy and occupational therapy from school which is mm -hmm. subsidized so you can't even think of calling in the therapist to the to the home because of course the risk of exposure personally i was so panicked because when this news broke out i just had a meeting we were at an award ceremony with very many people from everywhere and i uh, had a personal contact with um with an in-law who had come from London. So that mental destabilization on fear that, oh my God, maybe I carried it, I picked it from somewhere. So it took two weeks, first of all, to settle mentally. Uh, I was so scared that I personally started seeing symptoms and my son was, was recovering from a flu. So on top of the flu, you, you, the, the fear of even going into a hospital was also heightened. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I, I, I was just doing this medication. We've used this before. And because you're trying to keep saying mm. teenager who's come and home and he's not following a timetable because he thinks it's holiday, it's holiday time. And you're like, you need to continue with your studies. Um, 
business was interrupted immediately because I'm self-employed. We are the first ones who got hit. We, were, we had just organized a medical camp for special children, 6,500 special kids, which was supposed to happen on Saturday. This is Friday. We, everything is ready. Oh. <laughs> then you're told it can't happen. So by the time you can consolidate all these, cancel with suppliers, cancel with people, schools, children, buses, so let's just say my life was upside down for a bit. Then now you, you, you start adopting and you have to be a teacher. I have to be the doctor. I still have to be the mother and try and figure out what these kids are going to eat because now all of a sudden there is no income stream because all the events are canceled. Um, so I've tried to find solace currently by, I use my graphic design skills to communicate and push for uh, the advocacy and awareness through doing posters and caricature. So um, that is now where I found my sanity and stability because I'm, I'm locked up. The kids are all, uh, I have a, a child with ADHD major who settling down is off the window. We've had so much uh, broken items in the house that you can't shout anymore. So you find you're using so much energy trying to control these children because the level of meltdowns are intense. The um, Andrew would wake up screaming from morning to evening. He's nonverbal. I can figure out what he wants. You try to give him everything. Uh, you don't know if he's sick because he can't express his emotions. He only has three words, which will be more of, uh, of items like, I want this, or he will just give you one word, you figure out the rest of it. And let's just say, if I haven't gone crazy so far, God is great. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just trying to, like right now, I've to, I'm trying to come up with a different routine. Yesterday, I was being a teacher and a therapist. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm tra just trying to sit in the office. So you see, when you have routine, you have time for you, for self-care, mm -hmm. to regularize your mental state. Mm -hmm. so, and then for a frontliner like myself, I still have other parents who are looking up to me for support. So you have a lot of burdens to carry, but like they say, we are women, you're expected to be able to sail through everything. So far, I'm just trying to restructure and see what yeah. works. So yesterday, I would say, was the first time we had a, an extremely good day with no drama from morning to evening. This is one month later. So today is me time. Not really me time. It's my day at the office. So that way, I'm able to balance myself. Mm -hmm. So when I'm here, I'm able to deal with other parents and also try and, because uh, we're working on proposals of how to support and be a support system to them. So we're working on that. And when I go home, I remove this coat and become mommy. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I don't know how we can lift you up as well, because you definitely, you definitely need lifting. I will lift you up in prayer. Caroline, mm -hmm. you, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. I can totally relate with Sylvia. Um, you know, keeping the kids, keeping them structured throughout the day, every day in the same environment is very monotonous. Um, you also feel very anxious, so you can imagine how they feel. Um, like our elder son, Ethan, I find he thrives uh, with monotony. It's very interesting. He doesn't mind being secluded to do his own thing. As long as you structure him and give him activities throughout the day, he's very okay with that. We're very lucky that uh, we live also in the same place where the school is so we have a lot of space for the kids to play and the playground is 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 sufficient and we have a garden and we have dogs i feel for them when i look at them i don't feel like they're anxious or they feel like anything is missing although a couple of days ago they did get into the car and said you know we're going and they wanted to leave and they wanted to go and you know they were screaming their heads off the toddlers especially but Ethan, Ethan, the elder, seems to be quite settled um, because we have all his uh, materials. Uh, he's doing a bit of music. He, then at some moment, he'll go and play. Then he'll do a bit of gardening. Then before you know it, the day is over. And, and, and we just, we're just rolling with the punches, taking it a day at a time and, and just enjoying our family time together with their dad, myself, and uh, thankfully, we have an amazing nanny for the toddlers and uh, a manny for uh, Ethan. 
Uh, so there's a lot of support and everybody's sort of able to take time out for themselves and just do what they need to do. And I, I do feel for Sylvia. I wish she could bring the boys over and, and they can all play. But the, now with the social distancing, it's really difficult because everyone is sort of just keeping to their own space uh, to reduce uh, on infection. So, so far, um, I feel like we've managed quite well. I'm wondering, in this yeah. current um, situation, are there any opportunities? We've talked about challenges quite a bit. Do you think there are any opportunities? And could you share um, some tips with mothers or guardians that are also going through you know, similar, a similar situation? Um, sometimes, you know, you can try to see through the smoke, but the smoke is so thick that as much as you try, you just wave in your hand and you can only see like 10 centimeters from where you are. As um, there is the, the good side is, because you, you spend time with your children, you realize things you didn't know about them, and you get to see um, like new developments that maybe had missed you, you know, your attention because of the usual busybody we are. So that's one thing I'm grateful for. Um, and, and, and trying to be a teacher as much as it's not my cup of tea because of um, my level of patience and frustration. <laughs> because <laughs> it can be enough. <laughs> I always say I can only teach adults. Children is not my cup of coffee. Mm. But um, the other, the, the problem why I say looking through smoke is like we had tried to develop a routine whereby after two days I'd put the kids in the car. So we go around, you'd realize, okay, they would notice the, and, and read things out loud like that's the hospital, this is our route to doing this. We've managed to start um, small plays together. But then you see now the government also throws in the spanner. We, right now we have limitations of how many people can be in a car, you know? So mm. I think in my case, yes, my nanny is helping. Mm. Help. Mm. You can't leave any of the children behind. I can't go on my own. Uh, so I have to come with my eldest because he's now like my support um, system at the moment with, uh, when it comes to caring for them. So when they say that, you see, uh, without considering us, it's, it's, it's quite a blow. So um, what, the other thing that I try to do is take them to, an, uh, I spoke to their school because there are no people there. So I take them there with the bicycle and uh, then they, at least they have the police structures, they go and run there. So there you know, you're just, you know, just you as a family. And you're walking with your hand sanitizer, like, you know, the way the gardens are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you tell them, don't touch, and then you don't touch. So that, that's just a dream. So you have to, you just weigh your wrists and try and mitigate what mm -hmm. you can do. But then yeah. what to do? We, we, we are closer now and we are trying to live with, uh, adopt to the new environment and the challenges and embrace them. And the good thing that I can say that has come out of it is also now, I think my neighbors are not shouting at me anymore because <laughs> I'm not getting noise of keeping it down, especially after the feature we did on TV the other day, because that means our awareness has, has gotten out there. People are trying to see and they can understand what it is we are going through. So I'm just hoping that it will not end, no, it won't end now. And that even after when life regularizes, people will remember that the children are still who they are and they still need that love and understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Caroline, do you have any tips, any opportunities that you've seen? Um, I think the change has been hard for us all, we have to admit. Um, you know, sort of being cooped up in the house. Uh, and only maybe stepping out to do grocery shopping or essential, uh, you know, uh, purchasing of whatever is needed. But um, what we did uh, as a family is that we made small adjustments uh, for the children's schedules so they don't feel overwhelmed and then, you know, try and do fun things together. If we're baking, we bake together, they'll make a mess, but then we get to spend quality time together. Um, and then, you know, just going on YouTube to see what fun things we can do. We have extra toilet, toilet roll, you know, the toilet roll holders, uh, the brown bits in the middle. We use that to, to do a bit of painting and a bit of uh, creative stuff. 
So the kids have really enjoyed the quality time and just us being home a lot. Um, although for us, it feels like, okay, our routine has been changed, but I think the children are, are thriving a lot from it. And I'm also enjoying the, fam uh, the quality family time. And, uh, and I think the children are, are, are more settled when they see you at home and they're getting all that uh, lots of TLC from you. I think they, I, I find that they're enjoying it a lot. So um, although we feel overwhelmed in terms of, you know, being uncertain about tomorrow, um, I think this is a faith walk. We just have to roll with the punches, take it a day at a time and just do the best we can. And, you know, take all necessary precautions, like Sylvia said, walking around with that sanitizer and sanitizing every two minutes, wiping down the house, you know, with jig and cleaning up all the time. Um, I think that that's a bit of the anxiety that we need to manage the best way we can. And, and, and probably also, you know, minimizing on social media, what, you know, what message is out there, what news is out there, and just trying to see what's making you a bit anxious at the moment and just trying to minimize on that. And then, you know, what, what you're thriving from, what makes you happy and sort of increasing more on that as well. Yeah. Mm. And also what we've been doing is, you know, lots of phone calls, lots of video chats to regularly uh, connect, say with the grandparents, uh, other family members and other close friends as well. So that's been very helpful for us. Mm. Thank you. Um, has either of you, just yeah. to follow up on the, 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 yeah. the tips that you're sharing, has either of you seen or has had ha access to targeted messaging that um, caters to your mm. children during this period? That I think like Gemini, especially for apps and stuff like that, um, this week being, um, you're getting a lot of like speech therapy programs being being thrown your way in terms of, I know I got from Gemini, I got from you know, speech bubbles or something like that. But the thing is you get so excited because you're seeing an outlet like, yay, something I can do, something they can do that will build them, you know? Because now um, electronics have become um, an, more like a comfort. So you're having more screen time as much as they say we should be reducing. For some of us, that's the only time you will be able to take a rest, for, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what they want, and they learn differently. Mine are uh, heavily visual, and sing along is the thing. So with these ones, as much as you want to engage with them, once you start filling your information, you get somewhere, then there is a big price tag on it. Mm. Right now, of course, finances are tight. Okay, I'm, I'm, on, on, I'm sure it's everyone, but for us, in, in, in my particular family setup, right, Right now, you cannot, as much as it is important, it, it feels more like a luxury than just getting by to ensure that they have everything else that they need. So the messages are coming. And um, maybe, maybe one of the other things on the tips that we'll see is the, the, the sing-along games in trying to nurture now for the kids to be singing. And... Um, try to use the online other free online tools for parents to use to get them engaged because anything visual actually gets them really interested great thank you caroline do you want to add on that i find that uh, the more screen time the kids have the more like our toddlers they get very anxious and they want to constantly be on the screen or on on on, on the ipad on the phone so for us, we've just, when the weather's bad, then we try and do a lot more activities like, um, you know, something they can do, practical things in the house, but we're really minimizing on the screen time. For, for us, we find that it's just not been very good for them. Uh, it makes them a lot more anxious uh, because then when we introduce other, other activities, they'd rather be, you know, um, sort of on the, on, on the screen mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to doing other practical activities. So we've just been focusing more on the practical activities for now. I think that for them has, has been uh, created a lot more stability and kids are different and, and what works for us may not work for other people, but we find that that works for us more. Are there any initiatives that are targeting families mm. with children with disabilities or, you know, families of persons with disabilities? I'm curious. I, I'm, I'm not sure what is available out there. I think for the, if you look at the international media, 
because it depends on where you what where which platform you are on. Um, on 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 like on social media, mm. and stuff like that you will find we have advisories on how to handle and how to try and um, deal with the children at this time. But locally, first of all, the the I think we've been segregated, for lack of a better word, as the neurodiverse community for a very long time. Mm. If you look there, yes, they will talk about the blind, mm -hmm. they will talk about little, mm -hmm. little children and stuff like that, but our children are not being uh, considered per se. Only the past few days after the president announced mm -hmm. about uh, funds is when you're seeing a lot of discussion around disability. But then if you look at it still, um, from, there is a survey that I've, I've been doing for the past one week and the, the caution that most parents are feeling left out is even as this discussion is coming, there is so many people suffering, you know, we have parents who, who've mm. lost so much because out of the many groups, all I'm seeing is this frustration, frustration. And we actually have a platform where we've said nothing to do with COVID will be posted here. It's just support of each other because it's also becoming so much and it's so negative. For in my house, we only watch like the briefing to know where the numbers are then we get back to uh, like our time taking of this one likes this, this one likes this. Thank you. Caroline? Mm. Yeah, um, I haven't seen much locally in terms of support from the government for families uh, with, with, uh, with children with disabilities or families uh, and grown-ups with disabilities as well, people living with disabilities. Um, and I have been wondering, you know, uh, say... Um, Say, for example, my son did get the COVID and, you know, he was required to be admitted. You know, how, how is the structure on the ground for, for, cho for children uh, with disabilities? How, how, how are they supporting families? Are you allowed to go and stay with your child? Of course, you'd have to. I mean, there'd be no way around that because they can't even manage our kids without our help. So, you know, all those things do go on behind our, our minds and, and we worry, we do worry because, you know, apart from dealing with the normal day-to-day -day things, we have this peculiar thing that we, we are overburdened with on a daily basis, you know, and I think uh, that um, uh, mothers and fathers who are taking care of children with intellectual disabilities are really at risk of increased um, mental health issues because, you know, we don't have an outlet. No one's talking about it. No one is following up for you. We have our support systems, uh, maybe with the family, but a lot of people are burdened by themselves and keeping information to themselves and just feeling a bit overwhelmed uh, because, you know, we also feel like, you know, the government in place isn't really sort of supporting us like they should. And I found in the UK when I lived there that parents, they have a proper social welfare system going on and they really do care about uh, their people and they care about their disabled more than anything. And, and they do put proper structures in place and they support you financially, materially, and they're there. You know, here you might be unemployed and you have to support this child and you have to be there and their carer, like you said, and pair care work is just, it's, it's like nothing like you've ever experienced, especially when you have a child uh, with, with a disability. It's, it's really challenging. It's very hard. The services, the services just aren't enough. And, you know, we really, really just need to stand up and come together and just really push for this agenda. But, you know, as it is, I feel like the government is already struggling to manage the situation and, you know, they're not really sort of thinking about the, the nitty gritties of people with disabilities and how that will work. I think when they're faced with that situation, then they deal with it. But in terms of, you know, a plan for us, I'm not sure they have one really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the levels of preparedness within our governments are, you know, it's very clear that we, we are not prepared for crisis situations. Otherwise, for me, I think it would have made sense to ensure that the most vulnerable in the society is taken care of. We, we start with that as a default yeah. setting and yeah. then build other Absolutely. systems yeah. on, on top of that. How do you, as, as mothers um, mm -hmm. with children on the spectrum, how do you support them to ensure mm. their autonomy and that they're able to make, you know, uh, decisions? 
Okay, um, I think children with special needs have different capabilities regarding their own decision making. Uh, but I feel like they can make choices with support. And that's really what we've been trying to do with our Ethan and uh, the children at the school. So uh, we have quite a few older boys uh, at our school. And what we've been doing is just trying to get them to learn life skills, because I think that will be the basis of how they will be integrated into our society because at the moment there is actually no plan for our children in terms of how they will go out there and how they will live their life. Um, but if they're able to support themselves and learn a skill that will be able to help them in, in regards to, you know, being able to, you know, be structured and support themselves. Um, I think that will be very, very, um, very, very important and key. And we need to start doing that now. Um, I have a friend who lives in the Netherlands and uh, we talk a lot about uh, autism and, you know, he tells me that they have industries there that, and, 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 and companies that only hire uh, people on the autism spectrum, for example, and they have a proper social welfare system, proper infrastructure that works, you know, impeccably. If the bus is meant to be here at 10 past 11, it's here at 10 past 11. And our children thrive on routine. And if we had such a structure, it would work. But, you know, in the absence of such a structure, we just, we're just managing the best way we can. And uh, the reality is that we will have to be our children's support for a very long time. But if we can teach them to be more self-sufficient and to be able to do things for themselves, then, you know, they will begin to know that they can do things for themselves and they are able and are are capable of doing a lot more than you know people would imagine that they can do but with encouragement and support and that constant you know um uh pushing and 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 encouragement and just routines doing the same things over and over again uh they will be able to do things for themselves uh so you know one day they might even have families who knows and they will be running their own businesses i think they could be uh, very good entrepreneurs uh, as opposed to being in employment uh, and, and I think that's just how we see it and that's really what we're doing in terms of being able to support our children in decision making for the future for themselves. Thank you. Thank you Caroline. Sylvia, do you have any thoughts? Um, for me uh, at the moment considering the stage I'm at with my kids that is we're at the mm. pre -team. so it's now that they're grasping mm concept of uh, understanding there is yes, there is no, that I, I, I have a voice also. So as much as we're trying to give them the freedom to know that yes, they have a voice, we're also trying to teach um, responsibility at the same time. So as you, as there's trying to communicate what they want, you give the options with uh, repercussions that you, to get them to understand, like at this time, I want to play and I want to go outside. So you try with the simplest way to explain to them that you can't go out because X, Y, Z and try and relate it with something they're familiar with. So this is just uh, the beginning of um, molding them for decision making skills so that they're able to make the wise choices. My youngest is easier because he's, he's starting to communicate faster since we put him in a special school. So he understands the uh, decision. So you can give him options like either this or that, and he's, he's able to articulate what it is that he wants. So mostly the challenge will be with Andrew. But when it comes to the future, I am, I am saying that let me work so hard to see an influence policy and structure so that it is so inclusive that if anything happens, God forbid that I'm not here, at least I can rest in peace knowing that there are structures that will sort of take care of the children. Because not everyone will embrace him for who he is. Not everyone will understand that he would be slower to process like questions and the pressure that surrounds him. So if we do it now, and if we mold the future generations to be more understanding and to embrace difference, then that means the future will be brighter for them. And so we pray that at least there'll be some change in the community. Great, um, thank you. And to piggyback on the policy advocacy what would be you know some of the best ways and 
some key messages that should be disseminated now and possibly um, in, in building this critical mass that we're talking about, you know, they strengthen numbers. Um, what can we do in our various spaces to amplify the um, situation of uh, children with disabilities in this particular context? Sylvia? At the moment, I think as, um, as we're trying to, to speak up, if we could get back up in terms of let's see what we're exposed to, if it is the media platform, if we're championing so that at least the media is more inclusive, trying to explain what coronavirus is and, the, and, and that, if we could have people who have um, access to media to amplify and give, give a voice, because you see sometimes when you're a long ranger, and you're trying to shout. You can shout all you can, but not many people will hear you. Of course, there are more heavyweight, there are more experienced people in the field. It's a time where we have to come together as one, right? Because if, if, we, if we continue with um, the, the divisions that already are even in the disability space from personal experience, we won't fast. It's time for unity. It's time mm. for us to advocate more and harder. Be in the, let, let, let our plight be known, you know, so despite us being always in the background and hiding our children due to fear of stigma, mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. there is no more time for playing or I, I need to be private and stuff because we've seen parents committing suicide. We've seen a mother die and leave an unverbal child and the body is discovered three days later. We've seen where people going, or I have a parent who calls and say that they're, they're about to be evicted, they don't know what to do. Another one got laid off, they were already struggling and they're wondering what else do they do uh, from here because you have a sick child, you, you don't know where your next income is going to come from, you've just been laid off. Your contract has been terminated. So all these stories need to be given a platform to be voiced so that at least government knows that there are people who need their support and everyone else who's around you needs to know that there is someone who needs help. And also just being neighbors. If you ever realize that, oh, that child looks like they, they are different, then check up on them. Even if you know you maintain social distance, go with your mask, but just knock on that door. Because the level of loneliness right now is soaring at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know who to talk to. Mm -hmm. And one, one other parent reached out. Yes, we are the voice on the ground, but then I personally don't have the capacity to carry someone else's burden. Mm -hmm. I have on my plate right now. So where do they go? You'll try to do the best you can. But you see, the same government that's supposed to be helping us is still referring these parents for us to continue working with them. So who will be the one who will be standing for, for you? So uh, yeah, that, 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 those are some of the challenges that are like at this point, what mm. needs to go out is the government needs to step up. The structures, we can't rely on the past. We need to readjust the, the, the structures that are there now to ensure we get everyone. Everyone meaning... Mm. In that inclusion should be totally inclusion. It's always been about physical disability. It's about time that the neurodiverse community is also looked into because at this time, we are the ones who are suffering more. If you ask. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Caroline? Um, I don't know if I can add a lot more to what Sylvia said, really. Uh, but um, I think what we need to do for each other is just to be our brother's keepers and check up on uh, people you know might be struggling right now or going through difficult times because we are going through that. And, um, you know, send a message, quick phone call. Um, if you have something extra, you can, can send to somebody, do that. Um, because we, it's, it's such an uncertain time, so uncertain for all of us uh, because also kids are not going to school. Uh, some parents are not working, uh, parents who are running businesses are struggling to make ends meet, uh, employed people have no job security right now. It's just really difficult for everybody. So as a nation, we just need to stick together and be more patient with each other, be more inclusive and, you know, share information that will be beneficial for, uh, for example, parents on, you know, taking care of children with disabilities and uh, just seeing where, you know, where opportunities are and just being able to share that information with other people as well on how they can benefit as well. 
So for now, you know, just taking it a day at a time and, and just hoping for the best and, and just hoping we get past this in one piece and that we're all safe at the end of it all. It's really mm -hmm. my take. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, ladies. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation. We've come to the end of our session for today, and we're so grateful for your participation. Let's remember to continue the conversation on our social media platforms. If you would like to join the conversation as a guest speaker or discussant, please get in touch by sending an email to paza at this-ability.org. Remember to like, and share our content on Twitter at Paza Podcast. For more content on disabilities work and projects, please follow Disability on Twitter and Instagram at this underscore ability underscore ke and on Facebook at disability.ke. Speak soon and stay safe. <laughs>